Kicking off the list at number 10, going the distance. First things first, how much was an IPA back in the 1800s? That's why we clicked this video, right? That's all we wanna know. Some beers today cost like $13 at the bar. What's going on? Nowadays we have happy hour, drink specials, wine pairing suggestions that go along with your meal. We have affordable alternatives today at the bar. Back in the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel to get there. Isn't that wild? In the Yukon, their shots of whiskey were like 50 cents a pop. That was, that was a lot of money back in the day. If you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in Colorado, you could get numerous beverages for the same price. And as you would expect, the fancier the establishment, the more you'll spend. But either way, it's not gonna be comfortable. Number nine, manure everywhere. The 1800s were changing times, especially on the western frontier. Cities were being built, America was under reconstruction, and if you see my video on the 1800s technology, then you know how things were about to get a little wild. Except, something I wanna talk about today is, well, it's gonna drive moms and wives nuts across the country. How many times have you told your husband or the kids to wipe off their feet before coming into the house? Or stop wearing their shoes in the house? Right? It's the worst! I'm sorry, Mom. Okay, but imagine that, except everyone is bringing in their muddy, bloody, and manure-covered boots into the house. Horses and livestock were just a part of everyday life. That means droppings, or road apples, as they're so commonly called. The smell alone on a hot summer day could make any cowboy turn green. I think I'm going to pew, Dad! <laughs> Number eight, no stools. Okay, this one's for all the bartenders out there. I see you. I respect you. Bar seating is vital. You get your regulars coming in. Joan with the limp, she's so nice. She's always so nice every day. Always gets a grilled cheese. She's the best, always a smile on her face. Individuals who wanna grab a bite and read the paper, obviously they don't need to take up an entire table for eight, so you have spots at the bar. It's ideal, we're used to this. But back in the Western days, bar stools, just weren't a thing. Bar spots weren't, it, was, it didn't exist. You couldn't sit and vent to your local barkeep about why your ex hasn't texted you back. They didn't have stools at the bar, they just had the rail at the bottom for your foot. Just that little bar rail there for the little lean right there. A nice cowboy lean. Yeah, I'll just eat fish and chips standing up leaning. Awesome, just the thing you want after walking in the sun all day long. A foot rail. Number seven, duels at high noon. Let me paint a picture for you, partner. It's a warm summer night, and you find yourself sitting at a card table in a saloon that's named after a barnyard animal. The piano is blasting a ragtime tune as waiters bustle about, serving drinks to unruly cowboys that fill the establishment. In front of you are three unsavory characters, each more than the next. As the night goes on, so do the poker chips. And when one gentleman ain't taken kindly to his losses, some insults about each other's mothers are exchanged. A powerful slap reaches the man across the poker table, matching the energy of Will Smith on an Oscar night. <laughs> Too soon? I don't know. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> That's when it's settled. Tomorrow at high noon, they're gonna settle this like gentlemen. A duel at noon with, with guns. That's, that's how they did it. Does it get any more classic than that? I don't think so, folks. The clock strikes noon and only one outlaw remains. And he's married to Jada Smith. Number six, only talking. Ugh, here we go. You ever go to a bar, you're having a nice time, you and your pals order some Caesar salads for the table, the night is now well on its way. We're feeling good. Then 10 o'clock hits and you see a band start to set up. Okay, game time decision. Do we settle up and leave before they start? Or do we give them a chance, end up feeling bad, and feel obligated to stay until the very end at 3 a.m.? It's tough, usually the latter ends up happening. Back in the 1800s, we didn't have to worry about such an issue. Most of the time, these saloons were just for business. The odd time you would have poker, dice, a piano perhaps would be in the room with some jazzy fingers making an appearance. But when saloons first popped up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time it was for lawmen, miners, gamblers, just, just pure business. Not many blind dates happening in booths 16, you know what I mean? Number five, comfort of the ladies of the evening. Now being that it's the old west and there was just a shootout in the street, folks need to take their minds off of such horrors. Add into the mix long hard days, tending fields and livestock, people need to take off some steam. The local saloon is there for that. However, like a hidden menu at McDonald's, there's some other activities a man can engage in that aren't perhaps a regular service. Aw, oh, who the hell am I kidding? Ladies of the evening were quite common back then, actually. Naturally, it was a very dangerous job. However, 
if anything good can come from that, it's that in some cases these women became very wealthy. Wealthy enough to become the madam of their own establishments. And in some other cases, these madams were using their wealth to invest back into their towns, like building schools, doctor's offices. Imagine getting treatment from something and the doctor says, these bandages were brought to you by Madame Dover's Wicked Wizard Vacuum Double Sloshy Slush 9000. It's a great product, what can you say? Number four, interior decor. We've seen a Western saloon in movies. More often than not, it's the swinging door. You know, the classic, they always kick it in, boom, and dust everywhere and all over the place. Dust gets all on people's meals, the classic. You sort of need to kick those doors open, kind of, also. Because if you go through slow, it's just weird. It like pushes your clothes back. You need that cowboy momentum. In reality, there weren't a lot of swinging saloon doors. In fact, most saloons across the West were in pretty rough shape. They didn't look like a Tarantino set at all. They look like that one pub in that one town that one time, you know? Just not clean, not clean at all. You ride by, you're like, is that still open? How is that still open? These saloons were tiny rooms. We had stools or chairs made of fur. You know, no one's running fish tacos to tables in the 1850s. It doesn't always smell like a nice pub. You don't see something go by and you go, ooh, what's that? I wanna have that. No, that doesn't happen here. One of the fanciest saloons has to be the White Elephant in Fort Worth, Texas. It was two stories and it served fresh fish and oysters. Apparently it was a lovely time. Number three, manifest destiny. The destiny of America. There's a famous poster somewhere. It's like an angel guiding the pioneers west. It's like pointing doing something like that. Back to the history. What is manifest destiny? Well, for our non-American audience, it was this very core belief that since America had won its independence and begun expanding west, that they were destined to do so and keep expanding and expanding. Why should the freedom train stop here, right? Coast to coast, baby. And maybe buy Alaska from Russia, since, well, they're not really using it. Okay, and maybe Hawaii. They, they got pineapples or something, I don't know. All right, maybe even heavily influence places that are beyond US borders. But all that American influence and imperialism starts here. Imagine being the pioneer who dared to venture west, like the Great Oregon Trail, or those who crossed the desert states. And some really religious folks that found a salty lake in the desert looked at their wives and said, eh, I need at least two or three more. God bless America. Number two, mixologist. You ever go to a pub, like a chill pub, dare I say a restaurant, and a dude with a mustache thinks he's in Peaky Blinders for no reason behind the bar? He's flipping bottles that don't need to be flipped. He's lighting shots on fire. Guy, it's 1245 in the afternoon. What's your soup of the day? Where did this come from, historically? Where did the cool bartender role come from? I'm trying to order a Cosmo, but he won't stop doing stunts. In the 1800s, bartenders were referred to as mixologists. <sighs> Uh, they were top dog. They had to be. They were the fanciest guys in town. We're now doing impressions of these guys today, you know, with the bow tie and we pour it in fancy ways, because around the late 1800s, saloon owners were growing rapidly. So now you needed to have something special, something unique for the town. Like, say, a witty mixologist who can twirl his mustache as he pours a drink without looking. Great, now the town feels special, it feels unique. Manuals for bartenders came out around the 1860s, that's when things started to get more serious. A gentleman named Jerry Thomas published a guide called How to Mix All Kinds of Plain and Fancy Drinks. Today we still have that, but now it's a red sticky binder that says meal specs and Sharpie. It's not as fancy, but it gets the job done. Number one, dysentery. Nothing is more horrible, more awful than catching dysentery. Trust me, I would know. I never caught it, I just, sometimes I get diarrhea. Anyway, in Oregon Trail, the very charming DOS game. Gotta love that DOS color palette. Eye melting scion and violet, nice. This text-based adventure game, however, is grounded in some truth, as we can all imagine this wasn't a time of great cleanliness. Dysentery, typhoid, cholera, malaria, or more commonly known as yellow fever, and even scurvy, which you usually associate that with pirates, but cowboys got it too. Which, given the conditions of the Old West, makes for a not so fruit friendly environment. So yeah, it does make sense. Sadly for cowboys, prospectors, and everyone in between, there was a good chance you would lay down with a headache and then the rest of your posse would have to lay you down forever. In the ground, partner. Number 10, bank robberies. Okay, when we hear about the wild, wild, rootin' tootin', wild west, whatever, we think of outlaws like Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch, the James Younger Gang. Apparently, it was just bank robbery central back then. Just a lot of a lot of this and tapping and riding horses and stuff. That's really not true. Bank robberies didn't happen that often in real life. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies. 
eight. That many years ago, along 15 western states, there were only eight. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were roughly 4,000 bank robberies in the United States. Much more than eight. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by the famous outlaw Jesse James and his brother Frank. This went down in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. Fun rootin' tootin' history. Number nine, camels. My favorite actor growing up, hands down, was Woody from Toy Story. The guy's physical comedy was on point. And no, I don't mean Tom Hanks. I mean Woody, with this crazy little cowboy run, tipping his hat. But what's a cowboy without his horse, right? As soon as Bullseye got introduced in Toy Story 2, the picture was complete. A cowboy and a horse. We've seen this combo at some point in our lives, everywhere. But did you know that for around 100 years, camels were part of Texas wildlife? So imagine a cowboy on a camel. Yeah, that's real, That's that happened. Imagine two cowboys on the humps of a camel. How silly and intimidating would that look? Back in 1855, Congress spent thousands to purchase and ship feral camels from Egypt. The hot southwest would make sense when it comes to camels doing their camel thing. But by 1857, the army had 70 camels, things were going well until, you know, the Civil War happened, and then the camels escaped and all that madness, and then from then on, for 100 years or so, they bred and roamed Texas. Yeehaw, on a camel, how fun. Number eight, cowboys. All right, since we're talking about cowboys, let's really talk about cowboys. Who were these guys? Was everybody just a cowboy off the bat or did you have to earn it like a knight? What's the deal here? Well, the guys that we picture in our brain, like Woody, those are cattle herders and then buffalo, thousands of them, they would roam the land to eat and find water. They would travel miles away. So the herders would follow on horseback and then drive them back to the ranch. They mostly ate beans, dried meat, obviously, and a lot of coffee. Those are the three main ingredients of yeeing and hawing. Am I a cowboy? I love beans and coffee. Coffee beans? Huh, don't even get me started. A classic Western outfit was the denim jeans and chaps, the leather covers that, you know, go over your legs. The large rim hats were called Stetsons. Aside from looking cool, they were large enough to keep the sun out of your eyes. That hat would also double down as a drinking bowl for their horse. Sharing is caring. Number seven, the Bison Express. Humans are responsible for the disappearance on many, many wild animals in one way or another. It's usually our fault. Yeah, going back to the wild, wild west, the year 1869 specifically, that's when the Pacific Railroad was done. It was open to the west to all these explorers, but now they were whipping across these wild lands in record speed, passing hundreds of bison every single trip. Eventually, it didn't take long for these railroads to advertise hunting excursions on these trains. So yeah, guests would climb aboard the top of the train cars and hunt on the top of the trains. Yeah, on the top, they would just shoot these animals for sport. Obviously, the train couldn't stop and go back for the bodies, so they would just leave them. This one man, Orlando Bond, nicknamed The Brick, okay, he apparently shot thousands himself. He rode the express so many times his rifle caused him to go deaf in one ear. This was done purposely to deprive Native Americans of their food supply. Now our bison's number are incredibly low, something like 2% of what it once was, and humans, well, we're still pretty garbage. What do you know? Number six, alcohol. These saloons cowboys would visit, was there a bouncer? Did you need two pieces of ID? What was the drinking age back then? Well, besides the swinging saloon doors, it really wasn't a fun time at all. Alcohol back then, first of all, was basically just poison. Actually, it was literally poison sometimes. They had whiskey like 40 rods and Tao's lightning. You have a couple of those and you're literally passing out in minutes. Nobody was getting cut off in old timey saloons. The bartender wasn't like, hey, how about a water, buddy? Let's get you home. No, it was show. They had this one drink on bar rail called Tarantula Juice. Yeah, happy 21st birthday. Go throw up. It was made from strychnine, which was actual poison. So when the whiskey wore off, the strychnine would be left over in the patron's body, and it felt like tarantulas were crawling all over your skin. Ugh. Yeah, I'm good with a Bud Light Lime. Thanks, man. Number five, the gold rush. Picture a billboard for the wild, wild west, okay? What's on it right now? A cowboy tipping his hat in the corner with you know four missing teeth, a sunset in the corner obviously, maybe a horse, and also a bunch of gold stacked up in a mine, right? Well, we've heard about the wild west here and there, but was there really a massive gold rush? The California gold rush of 1849, despite what history commonly believes, wasn't the first big gold rush, not even close. The first one was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock right on his property. He had no idea what it was. And for years, he and his father, John Reed, used this rock as a door stopper. You already know where I'm going with this. 
The 17 pound nugget of gold, which is worth a lot even today, back then this information was game changing. Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right after. Then later in 1828, more gold was discovered, but this time in Georgia. This was the second rush. Then come 1848, James Marshall found gold at Sutter's Mill, California. After the third one though, that's when the thousands moved out west. That one had the biggest pull. So it's pretty big, but not the first. Number four, the OK Corral. The shootout at the OK Corral went down on October 26th, 1881. It's known as the most famous shootout in history. But should it be, really? Going back to Tombstone, Arizona, it's 3 p.m. and we have men of the law and of course, outlaws, all in the same block. So naturally, trouble ensues. There's not enough land here for all of us, some rootin' tootin' shit. There were about eight men involved in the rumble, but it barely lasted 30 seconds. Also, it's important to note, the gunfight at the OK Corral wasn't even at the OK Corral. It happened near the intersection of 3rd Street and Fremont Street, right behind the corral. Yeah, details matter. Three lawmen were injured and three cowboys lost their lives. Yeehaw. That's a sad yeehaw for you guys. This is why you don't organize shootouts at 3 p.m. I don't know, everyone's drunk, there's bad decisions, apparently there's bad aim. Just slam some milk, shake some hands, go home. Simple. Number three, Helena Duels. So we talked about the bizarre ways folks would settle beef back then. They would slam tarantula juice and shoot animals from the top of locomotives, have a 30 second fist fight in the middle of the day and then go home. But have you heard of these Helena duels? It began, of course, in Helena, Texas, AKA the toughest town on earth, at least it was back in the 1800s. The Helena duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They show this style of combat in a pretty brutal, Hollywood way. Both opponents had their left hands tied together with buckskin, and then each were given a small knife with an even smaller blade. It had to be short enough so it didn't reach any vital organ. That was the Texas trick. Then they're whirled around until they're dizzy, and then it gets really loud, really messy, and really bloody. Last man standing, pretty much. The crowd, of course, watches and places bets, which is always insane to me. I can't watch UFC sometimes. I don't like seeing things break, let alone a hell in a duel. Catch me inside sipping milk, texting my ex. Hard pass, freaks. Number two, train games. Entertainment was always a hit or miss when it comes to these historical lists. The Romans held gladiator battles with animals that drew in thousands of spectators from across the land. Well, in 1894, William Crush, a railway man, had this event in mind that would for sure go down in history. Oh buddy, did it ever. William Crush wanted to secure the future of the railroad company in Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. And to do so, William made an entire temporary city appropriately named the city of Crush. Nice. There was a carnival for children to enjoy and all that jazz, but the main pull for adults was the train smash. The collision of two 40 ton steam trains was meant to be the talk of the town. Look at these goliaths as they smash, or I mean crush, haha, <laughs> into each other. How fun. Yeah, the trains collided, it worked, and the darnest thing happened, um, they blew up. Yeah, it's almost like they caused a disaster for popularity, neat. 40,000 came in and many left injured. A couple of people sadly didn't leave at all. One survivor ended up getting 10 grand out of the deal. His name was JC Dean and they lost their eye in the explosion. So the company gave them a lifetime railway pass. Just the thing you want right after that horrific event. Sorry about your eye. Here's free PTSD as well. Anytime you want, enjoy. Crush was later rehired by the railway after it gained popularity. Yeah. This it happened back then too. Somebody does something horrible and then now all of a sudden they're famous. Hashtag chair girl. And finally coming in at number one, Elmer McCurdy. This one is insane. I had to end with it. Elmer McCurdy back in 1911, he decided to be a rootin' tootin' criminal and he attempted to rob a train. Unbeknownst to him, that train was not full of gold, but rather passengers. Collecting a whopping $46, which back then was still pretty good, he was quickly shot by a lawman afterwards. This is where things start to get insane. Yeah, I say start. Elmer's body was embalmed and sold by The Undertaker to this traveling carnival. His body was an exhibit almost, with his story attached. And for the next 60 years, his body, this prop rather, was passed around, sold between haunted houses and wax museums. Eventually, the guy's body, his real body, don't forget, ends up in California at an amusement park funhouse at Long Beach. Now, come 1976, there's a crew there filming for the $6 million man show, and that's when Elmer's finger breaks off accidentally. Some key grips like, whoops, revealing it was an actual mummy. They went to film the $6 million man and ended up finding the $46 man in real life. How gross is that? Kicking off the list at number 10, medicine shows. 
Nowadays, medical shows are fascinating. Dr. Pimple Popper, I can weirdly watch that all day. There's something about animal rescues, home renovations, or chiropractic adjustments, you know, I can never be bored. So back in the wild, wild west, the 1860s to the 1890s, they had medicinal showmen. Yeah, these guys would go town to town, of course, selling elixirs and tonics, but they would really nail this pitch. They would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience for these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman doctor arrives, he randomly picks an ill patient and then boom, just like that, they would be cured. One of the most successful of these elixirs was an elixir made by Kickapoo Indian Medicines from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any illness, but really it was more of just a laxative, so you were just in the bush and hoping it got better. Number nine, hop on my camel, partner. When you think of the Old West, you think long open ranges, spurs on boots, and cowboys riding camels? That's right, in 1855, the United States Army decided to import 75 camels to Texas. After all, the terrain in the Old West was fairly similar to the Middle East. The camels made supply runs between Camp Verde and San Antonio, but trouble began when the American Civil War broke out. Eventually, the camels were sold off or simply let go into the wild where they multiplied and began to cause havoc. So much so that folks began to spin urban legends, such as the Red Ghost, a 30 foot tall creature that made people quiver in their britches. When in reality, most people had never seen a camel before, and it was just a feral camel wandering the desert. But I mean, who knows? If Star Wars had a 30 foot camel in the snow, what's to say there isn't one running around in the American desert? Number eight, missing mines. There's billions of dollars worth of gold lost at the bottom of the sea. It's there right now, waiting for you. Yeah, I'm talking to you. But if you don't have goggles, maybe swimming just isn't your thing. No sweat, try the West. Yeah, there's dozens of lost treasure troves hidden in mines still to this day, like the San Saba gold mine or the wheelbarrow mine. There's a few we have heard from in literature from old maps, but none compared to the lost Dutchman mine. The legend has it that a man named Jacob Waltz, a German prospector, found the richest gold mine in the world. That's what he told his friends, and would we ever lie to our friends about gold and the location for it? No, absolutely not. The first gold rush was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock, had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father used it as a doorstopper. Yeah, they used a 17 pound gold nugget as a doorstopper, nice. Back then, this information was game changing once they realized that it was, you know, gold. So Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right afterwards. I just wouldn't have told anybody. I'd be like, is this an affinity stone? I'm just gonna pocket this and then head out east. Head out east. Number seven, Sideshow Crook. Elmer McCurdy was no different in life than any other bandit at the time. What makes McCurdy so unique is in his afterlife. McCurdy met his end on October 7th, 1911, after local sheriffs tracked him down from a botched robbery. McCurdy was taken to an undertaker and prepared for burial. Unfortunately, no one came to claim the lonesome bandit. Not getting paid for his services, the undertaker began to display McCurdy as a sideshow attraction, charging patrons a nickel to view the bandit. The attraction became popular enough to draw the attention of carnival promoters, who offered multiple times a purchased the mummified crook, but were all denied. As the years went on, McCurdy changed hands from multiple sideshow attractions and museums. One day in 1976, a film crew was setting up props for a filming. When someone began to move what they thought was a wax mannequin, it actually turned out to be poor old Elmer McCurdy himself. Eventually, McCurdy was laid to rest in a grave, where two feet of concrete were poured over his casket to make sure no one would come to steal the sideshow crook. Stay in the hole, partner. Number six, cowboys and aliens. Long before the Roswell incident in New Mexico, back in 1947, aliens might have actually visited us. Yeah, the report comes from 1896 from two men in California. They reported that three alien beings were trying to abduct them. Were these just cowboy pranksters? Maybe they had a few shots of whiskey from the saloon? No, one of them was a colonel. Colonel H.G. Shaw and Camille Spooner were going from the town of Lodi to the Fresno Citrus Fair, which honestly sounds like a wonderful time, just saying that. But on route, they were greeted by seven foot tall, slender, aliens. Yeah, the aliens didn't end up taking the two men because they were too heavy. These aliens were too thin and weak. Legit, that was the reason. They just couldn't grab them and take off. So they got back into their spaceship and they took off. How embarrassing is that? Hit the gym, E.T. Number five, Romeo and Juliet. What's in a name that which we call a rose? Any other word would smell as sweet? It's often said that art imitates life, but sometimes life can be stranger than fiction and oftentimes really similar. The Hatfield and McCoys were two feuding families in the time of the Old West, whose 
whose hatred of one another runs deep. The most serious issues being family members removed, Old West style, by the opposite family. And in one case, a court battle over the ownership of a barnyard pig. But perhaps the best story to come of this feud is the love affair of John C. Hatfield and Rosanna McCoy. The two lovers met and instantly fell in love with each other, their families instantly disapproving of their newfound love. Similar to William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the star-crossed lover's story ends in tragedy. After multiple attempts to rekindle their love, including a daring rescue organized by Rosanna to free John C. from her own family, their love never re-sparked, and John C. went on to marry her cousin. It's said that poor Rosanna died of a broken heart. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves my cousin? Number four, bank robberies. If you're going to parody the wild, wild west, you need a horse, you need a hat, and you need a big sack with a dollar sign on it. Apparently, wasn't it like Bandit Central? Weren't there bank robberies on every dusty corner in every dusty old town? But uh, no, there actually was very little, in fact. Bank robberies didn't happen that often back then. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies in total. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were around 4,000 bank robberies in the United States. So it got a lot worse after the Wild Wild West. Now we're on like Wild Wild West, it's like 70 wilds at this point. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by famous outlaw, you may have heard of them, Jesse James and his brother Frank. This was in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. We know all these bandits, but it's like they're just, they're just robbers, they're just bad people. We shouldn't really know them or glorify them, but they do this pew, 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 and ride horses, so it's kind of fun. And the number three spot, Good Bad Town. On your way out west, you may come to find that the unsettled lands are full of danger, bandits, crooks, perilous weather and the occasional tummy ache. When the town of Palisade, Nevada's railroad was expanded and people began to arrive in droves, the town boomed, but so did their boredom. Palisade was rather mild compared to the rest of the expanding west, so much so that when tourists began to complain of Palisade being nothing like the dangerous towns they read about in their dime novels, the people of Palisade acted by staging fake bank robberies, gunfights, and even Native American battles between them and the army, with sometimes the Native Americans participating. Also going as far as using real cattle blood during the stage combat. The citizens of Palisade were such effective actors that a lot of tourists began to run back to the train in fear of what they were seeing. Nothing more American than capitalizing on boredom. Number two, Helena Duels. Have you guys heard of Helena Duels? They're pretty intense. And they're a bit more intense than breakdancing battles, which honestly, it's pretty close, but these are like right above it. Helena Duels began, of course, in Helena, Texas, AKA the toughest town on earth. At least that's what they called it back in the late 1800s. It still is pretty close. The Helena Duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They showed this style of combat in a pretty brutal cinematic way. Opponents' left hands were tied together with buckskin and each were given a small little blade. It had to be short enough so you couldn't reach any vital organ. That was the trick. It was a brutal detail that made this an unusual event. But just like the Romans, in the Colosseum, everybody likes watching violence. Depending what era it is, people are like, yeah, we'll still show up and watch people die, sure. People would make bets during these duels. How did anybody watch these at all? I can't even scroll through Reddit at night without seeing something awful, let alone a Helena duel at like 4 p.m. And the number one spot, I don't like your snoring, partner. There were a handful of dangerous criminals back in the Wild West. This includes John Wesley Harden. Born to a reverend in 1853, his parents hoped he would grow up to be a preacher. He turned out to be one of the most deadliest outlaws to ever live. Harden claimed many lives over the years, but most bizarre was when he shot a man for snoring. One night in 1871, while staying at a hotel, Harden was having trouble sleeping due to the man in the next room snoring loudly. Harden promptly shouted at the man to stop snoring. Irritated with no response, he fired several shots into the next room, claiming the man's life. After years of being an outlaw and spending a lot of time in jail, he was released for good behavior, where he then received a full pardon. With his full pardon, Harden was unable to take and pass the bar exam, afterwards setting up a law practice in Gonzales County, Texas. If your lawyer has a longer criminal history than you, there's a good chance you're not gonna beat the case.